Hi, my name is Sandra Batakis, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. I have spent years working with Microsoft Technologies going way back to DOS before we ever had the hopes of Windows and certainly before we ever had hopes of working through technologies like Office 365 and SharePoint sites. With this experience in seeing all of the technologies grow and not just grow but grow together, we're now at a point where all of the experience of working through Word and Excel and PowerPoint and online apps can be brought together. In my professional career, I don't just stand here and teach it. I can honestly tell you that I deploy all of these technologies to all of my customers, and I spend a lot of time not only creating content, but migrating them over, importing all the data in, and then giving it some sort of workable form to send them forward. So it is my pleasure to take not only my favorite programs and share them with you, but to also share some great ideas that I found along the way. In this module, we'll get a chance to overview SharePoint. SharePoint is a fantastic technology that allows us to share a lot of information across an organization. We'll get a chance to see what initial sites you're given with to start customize when you first open up your Office 365 subscription. You'll get a chance to learn what a team site is all about. We've got an example of one. We'll pile through it to see what types of content you can add in there. And then we'll really hyper-focus down on some of the most commonly used elements, like the calendar, the libraries, and the tasks. Once we're done with those, with some common elements, we'll learn about how to add an app to the SharePoint site and then enable it for use. All SharePoint sites also have something called site settings. Site settings is simply the look, the feel, the permission, and what types of elements you want to have available, and we'll get a great tour of that as well. SharePoint has unlimited uses. So you get a look at your organization and how it's built. You might have an organization of three people. You might have 3,000 people. So if you have a small company with three people, this might be where you keep all of your documents. And you're going to organize them maybe by customer and then by office documents, maybe by category. But you can put all of your information up there into the cloud so that you can access it from virtually anywhere. So we have that perspective. Let's say you work with a company for 3,000 people. Well, now there's a lot of information that people need to find. So you might find that we have the reseller portal, a legal portal. You've got a Yammer license so that you all have social networking sites and communicate. Idea exchanges, collateral centers. You might find that accounting has its own SharePoint site. Maybe the help desk has its own SharePoint site because you can broadcast any amount of information and customize it based on who's going to come take a look. We can have elements in it like a document library. Think of a document library as literally a folder full of documents. But what's different is a folder of documents is exactly that. It's just a list. When you use a document library, you have a full search. And I'm talking even the contents of the files and you can search by a variety of attributes. Maybe you're looking for an Excel file that contains a certain word. But you can take it further by adding different columns of information and search based on that. You've got shared calendars, contacts, project workspaces. The whole point of SharePoint is to share information and also be able to collaborate on it. When you first start with the sites, there are some initial sites. Now, I put some paths here, but honestly, these paths aren't even very important. I just want to point it out because if you happen to look in the navigation bar on the address, you're going to see them appear. It is going to be very uncommon that you type this in. So when you have your SharePoint domain, it is going to populate your domain name right here in where it appears in each one of these examples. So if my domain name is Sandra Classroom, my site collections, if I want to go to the default team site for my organization, it would simply be sandraclassroom.sharepoint.com. I can access this SharePoint site collection from anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection and, of course, a valid login. So that's what we mean by domain name. 
Now, they throw a public site in there, which in this case would be sandraclassroom-public.sharepoint.com. Not everyone uses the public site. Most people already have a standing website that they're using that's publicly available. But if you don't have one, you can actually do your website in SharePoint and then broadcast it for public. You can also assign your full domain name so there's a redirect when you do www.yourdomain.com. You're going to find that in some of the search screens, or if you want to go directly to search, I can do sandraclassroom.sharepoint.com slash search and go right into a full search of everything available on that site. And you'll find that on that initial landing page where you land, whether it's about me or just you looking at your site collections, you'll see it actually changes a little bit to, in this case, sandraclassroom dash mysharepoint.com. So again, normally you're not going to type these in, but you will see those URLs change up in the top. Here's a good example of a team site. And if you've never developed a web page, it might actually be overwhelming thinking, I could never program something like that. But that is not the case. All of these elements are easily added onto the site by literally using an insert menu. So I might click here and say insert blog post because it's something that was already created and I can reuse it. Um, we can do a featured employee that might be insert something else and again it depends on the back end of what's going on. So they're all easy design elements. This right here is a calendar so I might say insert calendar and you're going to insert the one called upcoming events. And what's great is this could be the same calendar that shows everything this company has scheduled for the next three years. And I'm going to say show this calendar in the view called upcoming events. And there's probably a filter that says today plus 14 to only show me what's, show, what's going to happen from today to two weeks from now. So even though you have one calendar in there for all company events, you can reuse it or portions of it all through the rest of the site. Popular documents, there's a document library. So you'll learn about these as we learn about SharePoint, but I like to point to the example because if you just hear me say document library, document library, document library, it doesn't look half as exciting, I promise you, as seeing this in place and realizing what element you're actually looking at. A SharePoint calendar is also known as a list. And you're going to see me write the word list down perhaps more than you care to see it. A calendar is simply a list of events. Now, if we choose a display format that looks like this, then yes, it looks very much like a calendar that we would all recognize. But if I was to change the format of how that calendar shows, it could actually be a list that looks something like August. And then I'm abbreviating August 1st, August 2nd, August 3rd. So it can be a list of days. Or that list could be appointments that you have in August. So maybe 17th for your birthday. Maybe the 18th you have an off-site meeting. Maybe the 21st you're going on vacation. Now, this looks more like a personal calendar, but it is an example of a calendar because it's a list of events that you might have. So now let's take that list and create actual work-based events. So let's say on the 17th, we have a staff meeting. And typically on an event, let's think about it, what types of information do you have? Most people have the date the event name, the start, and the finish times. But what's great about SharePoint, if you think about this as a list, a list is rows of information organized by columns. So you can add columns to this. So I might add a column to my calendar called type, meaning appointment type. And that appointment type could be personal, it could be staff meeting, it could be a weekly update meeting. It could be a customer meeting. So you're actually taking a table of information or a list and you're doing something with it. You're adding that more information. So now when I add in an appointment 
for the 18th, I'm going to visit a campus. When I'm adding that in, I have to now fill in the field that says appointment type. And the appointment type is customer meeting. So why is that important? Because what you'll see is then you write a custom view. Now when I write a custom view, there's going to be a couple filters, and that's what it's called. It says filter. Show me the next 14 days in the calendar, meaning today plus 14, and show me only type equals customer. Now I have a view, so you might hit that SharePoint calendar and you're going to have this little widget that says upcoming customer meetings and it's only going to show you the next two weeks of customer meetings. Now of course I can add more columns like customer name and who's going to attend for the point of this written example, well I guess I'm out of room anyways. But as you look at each one of these elements, I want you to think about how you would organize it because we don't recreate the wheel. We simply filter and we use something called a custom view. Custom columns are going to help us get there and of course we can write permissions on any list we've got. We also have SharePoint document libraries and guess what? Document libraries are just a list. See, I said I'm going to say it more than once. It's a list of documents. You can filter that list in place. So now let's say I have my document library and I want something called recently added. So typically this is just going to have, I don't know, it could have three documents or 3,000 documents, but now I am going to sort it and I'm going to sort it so that the newest is first and maybe I limit it to the last 10. It's one of the many ways we can get that accomplished. So it's still just a document library, but I'm filtering it and I'm going to sort it. You know, and maybe the filter has some other thing in there that defines them as recently added, meaning show me only the documents added in the last seven days. That's an example of a filter. So guess what? We can list all documents. We can filter the list in place. We can sort it. We create custom views to show us the last 10 added documents and we can upload documents until our hearts are content. Now we get to talk about SharePoint tasks. You know what tasks are? Tasks are just a list. Now I keep repeating list because most people don't think of things like this as lists, but if you have the mindset of list, sort, and filter, you can do anything you want in SharePoint anywhere. So you can create tasks and subtasks. You can mark them as complete. You can assign them to others. That's the most amount of fun. Give that one to George. But you can also create custom views with tasks. So maybe you want to create a custom view that says only when the status is complete or when the status is in progress or if it's not started. Whenever you create those views, this is where they appear. So these are my three views. And if there's more than three, this is basically your more button. But I might also create a filter that says, give me only George's tasks. It's another filter. So we can filter for just what he's up to. Tasks, like calendar and everything else, do sync with Outlook. I don't say it every time, but everything you do here syncs with Outlook. So when you now go to tasks in Outlook, you're going to see yours as built through you and email and Office 365. And then you'll see tasks in team site. If you have a really good task list, guess what? You can export it, open it, you can throw it in Excel, Project or Access if you want to do something with it in another program. You can add apps to your SharePoint site. This is something that takes a couple of rounds before it feels natural. In fact, sometimes I still forget and you go looking for something and realize it's not there and you got to kind of skirt around. So when you have a SharePoint site, you have apps available for new sites. So I know that I'm going to click on SharePoint site, new, team site, 
and I'm going to have documents in there to pick from. I'm going to have maybe a calendar to pick from. But I may not necessarily have that custom list with the staff directory in it, or I might not have a graphic library for the images and the company's logo. So you actually have to go up into your site configurations, your site contents, and basically add all of the apps that you think you're going to need as you edit each page. So when you add an app here, it doesn't put it on the web page, it puts it in the list of things that you could add in the web page. So if you're looking to insert something and it's not there, you have to go to site contents, add the app, and again, now it's available. What's great about that is this event calendar that's been added, notice there's 48 items. So these aren't just to install, they're something with data behind them. I can now use that throughout the entire SharePoint site. One might be customer events, another one might be trade shows, another because you're using filters and views. So you're reusing the same information throughout the whole site. You're just filtering for what you want on that particular page. You can edit once you have all of your apps and you've got them on the page. You can edit anything you want about them. You will hear me say there's multiple ways to get in. But under site content, you're going to get a list of all the content that's been created that you can use on each page and you have a direct link in order to customize it or to create new content. Like let's say now I want a staff directory with certain information about each staff member. I would click on create content. I would create it. Once it's created, I can then add it to the site itself. And just to drive things home, guess what? Images, 14 items, that means it's a list of images. Site assets, two items, it's a list of site atoms. So if you just always think about lists, you'll always think of sorting and filtering, and the rest of SharePoint will be very easy. When you go into SharePoint site settings, we have a plethora of things to get into. A lot of this is truly advanced SharePoint site design. There's a difference between SharePoint at an end user level, I'm creating a team site for a particular project or team, versus someone who really is going to create a giant interactive SharePoint site for a large company. And I say that to put in perspective that a lot of this is outside the scope of the class, but the stuff that is important to almost every person that uses it is some of the stuff that I'm going to pull out. Under Users and Permissions, decide who can see your SharePoint site. If it's public information, then you never actually have to go in there. If you create it, you own it, you can do anything you want to it, everyone else can just look at it. There's some designer galleries this right here, again, is more advanced because you're getting into master pages and page layout and templates and, and designing them. And there's also a SharePoint Site Designer program that you can use. Under Site Administration, you might want to pay attention to regional settings and language settings depending on your organization. You could be a small company just uploading some content or you could be a large global company where this is going to be very important. If you've got people who have created sites, the employees will be like, oh, this is fun, and they create a brand new site, and then they lost it. They don't know the path to it. They don't know where it went. They don't know the URL to it. You can go into Sites and Workspaces and find it, and uh, if that's something that needed to be deleted, that's actually where you're going to go to delete the entire SharePoint site. Under Look and Feel, you can go through de Title, Description, and Logo. So you can start really navigating what's going to be on the title bar, what logo is going to appear on each page. You can also change tree view or non-tree view. You might want to change the look. That's great. It's all sorts of themes in there. Pick something that you like, even if you don't like the colors, because then you can also change the color scheme that goes with it. And if you're feeling a little advanced for the day, you can take a look at navigation and possibly start working through what's going to be in the top level menus. So there's a lot here in the site settings. I do point out the most important and some of them really do require a few days of sitting in a classroom or a little bit of reading in time.